This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV. The Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash ev9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Diane Eisnor about her company, Core, a new construction labor marketplace, and her experience helping organizations scale and being a serial entrepreneur. Diane Eisner, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm super excited to have a chance to chat with you. You have an interesting business, which we're going to be exploring together today. Uh, the name of your business is Core, and, and you're involved in creating a construction labor marketplace, uh, which is super interesting and fascinating. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about that um, and helping listeners understand more about what what you're offering um, to the market in terms of this resource, but also some of, of what you've learned in leading your organization um, and some of the, the lessons that, that would be applicable uh, for this audience. As we get started today, I wanted to share uh, your bio with everyone. Diane Eisner is a serial entrepreneur and the co-founder, CEO of Core, a newly launched construction labor marketplace supporting the construction workforce of the future. Third time startup CEO, angel investor, and powerhouse female business leader, Diane comes from a family of tradesmen and truckers whom she finally gets to serve full time. Uh, I think that's great. Uh, what, what a fun opportunity um, in, this, in this current company, to, in this current role to, to make a difference in the marketplace. And uh, I look forward to the discussion. Anything else you would like to add by way of personal background or context before we really launch into the conversation? No, not at all. It's been a wild ride. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, so let's start, let's start a little bit with that wild ride. If you could tell us a little bit about how you got to where you're at now, going from your previous organizations to now launching, you know, a construction labor app and this, this, uh, this construction um, marketplace. Tell us a little bit about how you got to where you're, where you're at and uh, what that journey has been like. You know, it's interesting. It's, um, you, you read a lot about leaders who have a pretty linear background. You know, they, I don't know, studied computer science, then got their MBA at Harvard. There's a lot of this kind of linear um, uh, path finding in the, in the valley, but um, my path was, you know, I think a little bit different and in terms of obviously where I grew up, there's not a lot of us from Brockton, Massachusetts out here in Silicon Valley. Uh, definitely not a lot of people um, with the kind of family that I come from, which is amazing. But like I, like you mentioned, it's you know truckers and tradesmen and um, really kind of wonderful people, but very different than, than who we see day to day out here. I actually went to school for painting. I thought I was going to be an artist. <laughs> uh, then I realized once I got to NYU that I was just a pretty mediocre painter and I decided to pick up business. Uh, but there was always that two sides of, you know, the very practical and pragmatic with the very creative and, and wanting to solve problems. Uh, and so it's, you know, it started there and I, I started my first company right after, right after college and it was an interactive um, ad agency. It was the, the dot-com era. 
And I think I became addicted to the adrenaline of building something new, these new movements and industries. And I just, I just love it. Uh, I love being a part of it. I love um, what I can contribute. And then as I got older, you know, you develop more skills and you can contribute more. And I, I'm probably most known for my work at Waze. Uh, Waze is the navigation app, which your listeners probably know. And I started the US office of that company in 2009. And I was the only one here. It was just a few folks in, in Israel who had started had started it. And I just, I, I loved what they were trying to do, their approach. It made so much sense technically and, and professionally. And um, I did that for 10 years. I, I ran growth. I uh, created the platform. I created ecosystems with broadcasters to get ways used on, on TV for, uh, uh, for explaining what was happening on the road to the traffic segments. Um, I started the program called Connected Citizens Program, which is something that really uh, meant a lot to me. And this was our work getting our data, non-personally identifiable data, into traffic operations centers. So if we were amassing all of this great information, that it was really important to see how it could be used to do something better, like reduce congestion and improve emergency response time. Um, so by the time I, I left Waze, um, we were in 800 cities and I was struck by uh, how little effort it took to make that kind of impact. Anyway, we sold Waze to Google. Uh, I was involved in integrating uh, Waze into Google, stayed there for another five years after, uh, after we sold the company and it really just learned a ton about navigating this other level of scale. So as an entrepreneur, you don't always get to tackle scale, you know, the kind of dollar volumes and user volumes. When I started at Waze, I think we had a couple thousand users. And when I left, I think we were at about 150 million. So it's, um, it was really a great amount of learning. Uh, and so that was a privilege. Anyway, that's when I fell in love with cities and I left to go start the cities division of WeWork. And that's where I encountered, well, they insert Biggles, whatever. It was, it was also its own ride. But that's where um, I was looking at integrating software and data with physical space because they had offices in 110 cities. And the question was, how could we do more? So for example, if you have an ID that can be used to access your office, can it also be used to access public transportation? What else can you do to build community outside of the walls of, of WeWork? And that's pretty much what we were, were working on. We didn't do it very long, uh, but it was enough to feel the pain of building physical spaces. Um, the timelines, the labor shortages, the, um, the constant change. And we have constant change in software as well, but it's just, um, you can hide it better. So the scheduling nightmares, I just came face to face with a lot of those problems. And so after my team and I left, we work, we thought, okay, first principles, we're not going with a, a whole bunch of money out. We need to focus on one thing. What should it be? And we knew it would be in construction, but we just spent time talking to hundreds of workers at that time and, and GCs, and we figured we have to focus on winter. That's the number one challenge. It's a big global challenge, 180 million workers. And it's not just that there's a labor shortage, which is a huge problem in itself, but there's just so much friction in a worker finding the GC who has a project right now um, and having access to clear training and career development. If I'm a carpenter now, how do I make sure I'm going to be a foreman then? Or, you know, how do I plan my career path? I just thought it would be really uh, important to spend time doing that. So that's what, that's what we're doing. That brings us to court. Well, great. And and my next question was going to be, tell us a little bit more about why you started CORE. You, and you just kind of started to hit on that towards the end of um, your previous comment. But I'm wondering, is there, is there anything else that goes into kind of that, those early stages of of launching this new endeavor um, with your partner and, you know, making those initial decisions to, to focus on the labor piece? Yeah, you know, at that time, we were having in-person conversations, we were doing surveys, we were doing a lot of research um, into what, what part of the problem could we help with because we don't come from the industry, right? I come from that background and so does my partner, but um, uh, we haven't been in the industry, we've been in tech. 
So we wanted to make sure that we were putting ourselves in a position that we could use technology to be helpful uh, and that it was really something that was going to be benefiting an ecosystem. I love ecosystem plays. This is not like big bad tech company coming to disrupt the whole construction industry because we think we know better. This is, okay, we heard that you guys want this. This is the, these are the skills we have and let's just go pull it off. But you know, there was, you know, a time when we thought, well, are we gonna go more in the education and training space? Is that where the real problem is? Are we gonna go purely on the marketplace? Are we gonna go more on, well, it's now what I call logistics for labor, uh, but you know, how do you, how do you make it easy for companies, a little bit more of a SaaS model, um, to bring in these new people to manage their existing teams? Because it's pretty wacky. Whenever these big guys, they, they win a job, and then it's almost like starting a new company for them. Who's gonna be available to do the work? Who has the right skills? Even within their own organization, they often don't know uh, because there are no good systems in place. And so what we ended up circling around and, and honing in on was, Okay, we, my, my partner, he also, he was at Google for 15 years and has 100 patents and it's it just, he's such a great thinker and, and innovator. So um, his idea was, you know, something sort of similar to, uh, to Google's page rank, which I think everybody knows now, but worker rank. And then worker rank is not just to staff rank workers who's better than someone else, but for a specific project. What are the skills that are needed? What are the certifications, the training, but also the soft skills? And so the, the first piece of the platform we built is this really great matching engine uh, that can take either candidates that are outside of your organization and match them uh, to specific projects, or even people inside of your own organization where the information is kind of scattered about their skills and their availability and, and all of that. So it's really, um, Step one was, okay, we're doing this matching algorithm and let's go build it and we built it. Uh, and then of course, technology is one thing, but we've now had over 2000 conversations with workers as they onboard onto the platform to learn, learn what's important to them. So lots of talking. <laughs> awesome, yeah, that's, that's really great. And can, can you walk, you, so you talked about the matching algorithm. Uh, can you walk us through a little bit more of what the app does and and how, how this marketplace works yeah so there's there's the web and then there's the app uh, and so the web is really you come in and you create a profile if you're a worker but we make it really easy so um, we vet the certifications that you give us so we make sure that they're real you can give your references that can confirm your skills and we'll do all of that checking um, you know the things that I've learned are that people in this space, on the trade side, they don't promote themselves very well. So they might have a resume, likely they don't, but in the resume, they might not be giving the things that companies are looking for. And so addition to, in addition to getting all of the information from our website, we try to have a five minute phone call with every single worker. And we can pull out things like, if they're great collaborators, if they, you know, are entrepreneurial, if they are, we can pull out all these other things and they're, they're just so free when they're talking about their skills. Uh, so we combine those and that's all the data that's going in. And then we score everything according to what we know about all the things that are going to be, you know, take to make this job great. So for example, if somebody's hiring a general superintendent, which everyone's hiring general superintendents, the things that matter most are what are the size of the projects you worked on before? What was the dollar volumes? That's how you figure out a good fit. And often this kind of information is not even on the resume. So we just try to make sure that there's good data coming into both sides. And then the magic is, is the rest. Um, and, and actually the technology is the easy part. Yeah. Um, it's getting people to feel comfortable talking about their skills. It's much harder. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's generally a problem. Um, there, there's some industries where it's not as much of a problem, but I, I would say across the board, the vast majority of workers across job types, across industries, 
don't do a particularly good job of <laughs> conveying their skill set and selling themselves to the organization. And it doesn't at all surprise me that within the trades in the construction industry that that would even be more of an issue. Um, so that's great. I mean, you're doing the hard work of, of uh, the fact that you call everyone and have that conversation. That alone is just such a ton of work. Um, and it's so important so you can flesh things out a little bit more, yeah. have, a, have a better picture of what you're actually dealing with. And, and I like that proactive approach too, um, because, you know, especially in areas where we have labor shortages um, and construction and the trades isn't the only area, right? We have labor shortages in lots of different places yeah. in our economy. Um, and, and so organizations are wanting, you know, they, they're needing um, skilled labor. Um, they, they want people with the experience and with the credentials, um, with the, the hard and soft skills. And, and so they're willing, you know, most organizations are willing to put some money behind that because they know how much it matters to the success of their organization. The employee is that vital resource without whom they can't function. Right. And, you know, in construction, obviously you're not going to be building anything uh, without the actual workers. Uh, and the same thing in it, you need the, the, the technicians, the coders, and um, to be able to build the whatever you're you're dealing with, the software and every other industry, right? So, so the people aspect is so vital. Matching up is so important. Fleshing out the skill sets is so important. I love that you're doing all those things um, with this with this service. Yeah. Um, so, if you're a worker, you just come in, you complete that profile, you talk to us. And then you're in our system. And when we have jobs that match you, we just send it directly to your phone. So you don't even have to do, like we're trying to take out the job search because what happens is you end up spending so much time looking through things that are totally irrelevant for you. Uh, and so our platform has a big text and, and push notification component. And you're only going to get notified if you think something is relevant to you. Uh, and then the same on the, the company side. The company will get their job description in, um, what role they're looking for, and then they're only going to get a list of candidates that we think are highly relevant for that. So you're going to have fewer candidates and, and, and fewer job um, lists, but we're trying to just save people time and make them better lists. So what we do for the companies is we actually give them the score for that particular job too, and then companies are, are able to give us a score back. So if we say somebody is a um, in 85, and the company comes back and says they're a 90 for this role, then we learn something from that. Or if we think they're a 90 and they say, oh, that's a 65. So we've learned in that process, what are the gotchas uh, for every single one of these different trades? And obviously we're still learning, but that goes into this big data stockpile that's helping us make those really good connections. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So so you ha you've had such a successful career, a serial entrepreneur, you've worked you know, in small businesses, you've worked in, in large corporations. Um, you've talked a little bit about the scale up and how difficult that is. Tell us a little bit more now just about CORE as an organization and as an organizational leader. Um, how many employees do you have? What types of challenges have you had as an organization as you've been trying to build out and, and uh, scale yourself? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, so, Almost everybody on our team uh, I've worked with in the past, um, or someone has worked with someone else. So we're only a team of seven. Uh, and like I mentioned, the, my CTO, he, you know, we worked together at Google, and then he came to be the VP Eng at WeWork, and now we're excited to do this together. Um, our head of operations, Jenny, who's also a co-founder, um, I've worked with her for, for six years at Waze and Google and this. And, uh, and then uh, one of our key engineers uh, who decided to join us, we also worked together at WeWork, but he sold the company to Dropbox. He was early at PayPal. We have a small team of people that uh, we always joke that it's not our first rodeo and we've done this all together. And, you know, I'm often conflicted about that because it definitely, I mean, we know how to work together. We're executing very, very well. And that's one of the ways to mitigate risk in a startup. There's a hundred reasons we could fail or more, uh, but it won't be because our team executes really well together. Uh, and so I feel like 
I've learned a lot about knowing if someone is going to be great at their role and making sure everybody gets to do the thing that they love and that they're really good at and that they have a team of superstars around them that they're going to respect the opinions of that person. Because one of the worst things when I have earlier companies is when one member of the executive team doesn't trust the other member, if it, you know, if marketing doesn't trust technology, doesn't trust sales, it's a mess. You're just spent, you're wasting too much time fighting against each other. So for me, it's really so much about the team. And you know, now we're still in you know seed stage, right? Which means we raised our first round of funding. It means that we don't have product market fit yet. It means we're still building everything. We're building the car while driving. Uh, and so you have to reduce the risk as much as possible. That said, I've been trying um, to build relationships and to make sure that we're interviewing people that are outside of our domain. You know, that next generation of people who we haven't worked with before that come from the trades that are, our team is pretty diverse too, but it could be more diverse, right? How are we going to get those candidates in? And so I think a lot about uh, the diversity of the team and, you know, that always makes for a better team because you can just have better thought partnerships, you can solve bigger, more complex problems. So that'll be the next thing. But for now, it's like, I didn't take any chances. Seven people. And then we have, you know, a, a few engineers, front end engineers are in Russia. And, you know, we have a call center that's helping us handle some of the volume of all these conversations with the workers. So we're, we're kind of starting to outsource what we can after we know what the process has to be. But it's just small, small right now and all yeah. that. So, so how has that experience been either pre in previous roles where you've been in these small startups and now, you know, when you're in that same kind of situation versus being at like a Google um, massive corporation, uh, how, how have you navigated those differences? It's funny, they all just kind of fuse together. It's, I, I mean, at this point, you know, I, I've, I've done this a few times, uh, not always successfully, but I know the stages, right? And I know how to set expectations. And I think setting expectations is something that I didn't do as well uh, in my earlier parts of my career, right? Like uh, I would say, okay, I would actually think that the first iteration of a product you put out, people would love. <laughs> what was I thinking? Of course not. Um, I underestimated, for example, the amount of feedback and the amount of iterating and learning. And so now I feel like, all right, I know I have a pretty good sense of what are the expectations for this stage of my company? When should we be thinking of revenue? When should we be thinking of users? How are we getting the information? How do we know if we're doing well or not? And so I feel like that setting of expectations um, is the thing that gets better and more honed over the course of my career. And you know, I, I hope that this is a company that's gonna go successfully from seed to product market fit, to scaled revenue. Um, and that now that I've been all across the board, um, I hope that I'll just be able to navigate and set those expectations appropriately so that we build something really valuable and really important. Very cool, very cool. Um, as we get near the end of our time here together today, I did want to give oh, you- Oh, that's just a bummer. That's, this is, this is fun, actually talking about- <laughs> Well, good, good. Yeah, I've been enjoying it too. I've been enjoying not only getting to know you a little bit more, but getting to know your company and just being able to talk through these types of issues that, you know, we're clearly both passionate about. Um, and perhaps we can uh, continue this discussion again another time and, and you can come back on and share with us, you know, as you continue to move through the stages and, and uh, roll things out further. Um, but be before we part today, I wanted to make sure I gave you time um, to give the last word and to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your company and anything else that you would like to share. Great, uh, so you can go to the web, it's bycore.com, B-Y-C-O-R-E.com. Um, if you are in the trade, thinking about the trade, please come give us a shot. Obviously, everyone in construction, we want your feedback, we'd like you to be in. Uh, and then in terms of last word, I just wanna say something is interesting, interesting is happening in the human capital sphere where I feel like, do you remember in the 80s or 90s when the military, the army started doing all these commercials and, it's, it, and the marketing didn't make you think that you were fighting or going to war. It was like, I get to fly a jet. 
yeah. I get to wear an invisibility cloak. I feel like the construction industry is getting smarter. It's about to be really cool to be in construction. You know, we've got autonomous excavators and inspectors get to have drones. I feel like it's right for a whole new group of people to make this an awesome career opportunity for themselves. And I hope they do. And it's on people like me and others in the industry to make sure that their career path is there and that the money and incentives continue to grow uh, so that everybody can be happy. It's a good alternative. That, that's excellent. And I love that framing uh, of the evolution of the industry and um, the role of technology in tr kind of transforming uh, the, the skill sets that are needed um, and really just the, the sexiness of being, you know, uh, in the trades and being a construction worker. And, you know, in a previous life, long, long ago, I did have um, some time where I was uh, working in the construction industry back long before anything that you're talking about, you know, in terms of, of, of drones and any of that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, but even then, like it, it is a rewarding line of work um, yeah. because you're building and you get to see in real I time. This. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's incredibly satisfying to be able to see the fruits of your labor and that you, you have built this thing. Right. And you, you put on top of that um, all this cool technology and the, the new skill sets that are driving the, the shifts in the industry. And it really is a great career path uh, for for people and so it's it's important for organizations to recognize that it's important for uh for the labor force to, to recognize it as well so i i applaud you for for the work you're doing in your company and thank you so much for joining me today i hope listeners will reach out um get connected find out more about what core can do for you and as always i hope everyone stays healthy and safe that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day and i hope you all have a great week We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.